Here is Danielle Mikkel. Thank you, Danielle. And I'm, we're looking forward to learning more about um, challenging behaviors. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be with everyone today. And I just want to say thank you to each of you that are logged on because uh, the role of a caregiver is probably the most underrecognized job that there is out there. And uh, you guys all deserve a big kudos as well. And just so you know a little bit about me, I mean, obviously you read my bio, so I'm not going to talk about that. But what I do want you to know is that I was a primary caregiver to my own grandmother who lost a 14 year battle with Alzheimer's disease and um, also an underlying depression. So uh, I have been there firsthand and it is one thing to talk about it uh, and another thing to do it. So I am by no means an expert in anything except I often joke and say I'm an expert in chocolate. So uh, hopefully you'll learn a little something today and then when we have time for question and answers at the end, um, I'm sure that I will also learn something from you. And some of the strategies that I learned in my personal life and professional life in regards to managing behaviors have been from other caregivers. So uh, I would like to thank them too for providing the information and the resources for this program. So we will get started. Um, first, I, I really want to talk about behavior in general. And uh, behavior is a form of communication. And I think that's one of the most important things that we have to remember in looking at you know, our loved ones, our care partners, when they are experiencing some type of behavior, whatever that may be, that they are trying to communicate something to us. And a lot of times I will challenge people and say, is it actually a challenging behavior or is it a behavioral expression? Are they trying to express something to us? And they are unable to do it obviously verbally um, because their brains are diseased and not functioning well. So again, it is a form of communication. And if there is not anything that you take away from today, and I'm going to say this a couple of times and there's gonna be some repeats in the slides, that behind every behavior is an unmet physical or emotional need, okay? So again, behind every behavior is an unmet physical or emotional need. And our job as a caregiver, whether that's personal or professional caregiver, is to figure out, okay, what is that need? What is that person trying to express to us? And how can we effectively you know, uh, meet, that, meet that need, right? So first we have to ask ourselves, when is behavior actually a problem? Um, because again, I said, is it a challenging behavior? Is it, is it a difficult behavior or is it a behavioral expression? So by definition, when behavior becomes a quote unquote problem, right? is when it causes emotional or physical harm to the individual engaging in the behavior or to others, okay? So that doesn't mean is the, is the behavior an annoyance, okay? It's is that behavior actually causing emotional or physical harm to the individual themselves or to others? And that's when a behavior, we can categorize it as possibly being becoming a problem at that point and not just a behavioral expression. All right, so talking about some examples of, of difficult or challenging behaviors, and I'm sure um, that all of you can probably add some things to this, but just wanna go over a few of them, and I'm sure a lot of you who are on today have experienced some of these things. And uh, the first one is verbal repetition, uh, yelling, shouting, and threatening behavior you know, wandering or pacing, which again, I said earlier, um, they're calling about, they're, they're calling that now more about walking about behavior instead of wandering. But for the purposes of this training, I'm going to say wandering. Uh, physical aggression, resisting care, hallucinations and delusions. So uh, I just wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the difference in these two, because sometimes we, we get them confused. And hallucinations are, um, you know, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling something that's not there, right? It's a, it, it's a sensory issue. Whereas delusions are a false belief, okay? So a delusion, an example of a delusion is belief that someone is stealing from you. So by the way, with Alzheimer's disease specifically, as the most common form of dementia, 
Alzheimer's disease, the most common delusion, right? The, the most common thought or misconception is that one is stealing from, some, from them or that someone is cheating on them. So, so those are the two most common delusions. Uh, disinhibition. So with Alzheimer's and other related dementias and other related diseases, neurocognitive disorders, a lot of times a person's filter becomes broken. And that's because that part of the brain is being impaired and being affected. So people say and do things that we would not consider socially or politically correct, right? And uh, I could certainly give you many examples of, of things that my grandma Millie did as well. Um, so that is something that often happens with the degeneration of the brain, but disinhibition is even more common and significant in frontotemporal disease or frontotemporal dementia. Uh, and sexual inappropriateness, that kind of goes along with the disinhibition too. And again, um, with the sexual inappropriateness, that is most common, again, in a frontotemporal disease or frontotemporal dementia. Okay, so what happens is that it depends on what part of the brain is being impaired, and that will kind of equal the symptoms and the quote unquote behaviors that may or may not present. And let me say this too, and I probably should have said this from the beginning, when you've met one person with Alzheimer's disease, when you've met one person with Lewy body disease, when you've met one person with frontotemporal disease, you know, you've met one. So we can talk about generalizations, right, uh, all day long, but the truth is that every individual is different. And that's so important to remember, especially looking at behaviors and how to manage these behaviors because all of us are different and we're going to respond differently to different strategies, right? And we're also going to, our behaviors are going to be expressed differently because we're all so unique. And that's really important to remember. So we're talking about generalizations today, but remember that it's a person-centered approach, okay? You know this person best, you know your care partner best. So you may, something that might work for one person may not work for you, or you may have to alter that, right? So one of the things that I had to keep reminding myself um, when I was caring for my grandmother, and let me just say that uh, Grandma Millie was the kindest, most gentlest soul that anyone had ever met. She was a Sunday school teacher. She worked part-time at the local library. Uh, she taught me my first prayers. She played the piano. And when Alzheimer's disease started to take hold, uh, it, she became a very different person and would say words that I didn't know she knew and in some cases didn't even know existed. Uh, so it was a big change in personality. And that's one of, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the symptoms that there might be something wrong is that when someone changes their personality. And I had to keep reminding myself that that is the Alzheimer's disease, that's not Millie. And I actually had to say that out loud like a mantra because there were some things that she would say and do that it was very difficult, we're human, not to take personal. And one of those things and a story that I will share with you is when Millie was going to uh, an adult day program before we had placed her in assisted living community. So I went to pick her up. I would leave work early two days a week and it was my two days to stay with her, to have dinner with her, to stay the night with her. And uh, she was really upset when I went to pick her up that day and she started arguing with me and insisting that the bus was coming. And this was a day, for some reason, Tuesdays and Thursdays, back then, they had no transportation. So after much convincing and you know, trying different things, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, we finally convinced her to get into my car and take her home. She uh, hit me in the side of the face. And I had to pull over on the side of the road. Obviously she tried getting out of the car. Thank goodness for child safety locks. And um, it was 
it, it was probably one of the worst experiences that I had as being a caregiver was because of that physical aggression. And I remember finally getting her home and I was so upset and, and so angry and I was trying to rationalize with her, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later is probably the, the worst thing that I could have done at that time was trying to rationalize with an irrational brain, with, with an irrational disease, right? And I remember saying to her, not one of my most proud moments for sure, but I raised my voice and I remember getting so upset and said, do you know that you know, I, I am completely changed my life because I, I'm, I'm helping to care for you. I'm, I'm picking you up every day. I'm, I'm, I'm making you dinner. I'm cleaning for you. And I just kind of, I lost it a little bit. And um, again, I, I still get a little bit choked up when, when I tell stories like this. And I remember feeling terrible afterwards, right? And the good thing is that she didn't remember what I had said. Um, but I had to remind myself when I started to get really upset, because again, I'm human, is that that is the Alzheimer's disease. That's not Millie. And I continuously from then on just said that out loud. So when I was feeling frustrated, when I was feeling upset, um, I would just say, this is the disease. Okay. And so that's one thing that I think is really important for us to remember as caregivers. So as I mentioned, behind every behavior is an unmet physical or emotional need, right? So there are reasons. And I'm gonna talk about some possible reasons, again, generalizations, um, but there could be many things that, that cause these. But just to take a look at why, why are some of these things happening in a person that I care about so much? So let's look at agitation, right? Agitation um, could be triggered by an unfamiliar, uncomfortable, or overwhelming situation. So something like someone, uh, you know, trying to help me get dressed, right? When I know in my mind that I have dressed myself, you know, my entire life. And so I may just be very uncomfortable with that. And because I don't have the verbal ability. I, I'm aphasic or I, I'm stumbling over my words. I can't say, leave me alone, this is uncomfortable, right? So I may in fact become agitated. Um, and there could be many, many other reasons too. Uh, because the person is too hot, they're too cold, it, it's too noisy. I don't know. Think about the things that, what are things that agitate and annoy us? right? And those are the things that we have to look at in a person that we're caring for. Um, so what are the things traditionally in the past that have annoyed them? You know, for me, I, I say we, we all have our pet peeves, right? We all have little things that, that drive us bonkers. Um, driving in New Jersey is one of those. But one thing for me is um, when someone grinds their teeth, or they take a, a fork or silverware, and they put it in their mouth, and then they, they, grind, they scrape their teeth, <laughs> on the fork, um, that for some reason, that just sets me off. It, it starts my, my heart pumping. So again, we have to think about what is the reason why this agitation is happening. Uh, wandering, again, that could be triggered from boredom or somebody's feeling overstimulated in a situation. There's too much going on and their brain can't process it. Maybe they're feeling lost or they're looking for something Maybe they're looking for the bathroom, you know, because they, they need to go and they feel that they're in a strange environment. So there's lots of different things. And we could talk about just wandering, you know, as one specific training as well. Uh, repetition, that can stem from lots of things, feeling worried or forgetting, what, literally forgetting what was just said, you know, or not hearing what was just said. Um, or just simply trying to hold on to the presence of another person. So that may be a reason for extreme repetition. Disinhibition, I talked about that already. A lot of that has to do with brain-related changes. So that's because the person's filter is literally broken because of the progression of the disease itself. 
delusions and hallucinations may come from confusion about not knowing where they are, or like I said, the most common delusion in Alzheimer's disease is of theft and infidelity. So feeling that things have been stolen, stolen from them. And again, where does this come from? This comes from the biological and physiological changes that are happening in a person's brain. This comes from the disease process. Aggression um, could be a sign of loneliness, you know, misunderstanding of events, um, expression to remain independent or in control. And I wanna just highlight that because a lot of times, obviously, um, just as we get older, uh, my mother yells at me a lot for this and she says that, you know, she's going to make her decisions and she doesn't need me to make them for her, right? So as uh, someone progresses along in the disease process, they also are losing their independence and their control of almost everything. And what they can control a lot of, you know, sometimes is how, is how they act. Um, and if they can't speak, for instance, but yet they can act something out. So sometimes it is just because that is what they feel they can do to remain independent. And all of us want to remain independent. So you can kind of understand the reason behind that and the rationale for that. Um, eating problems or difficulties eating, you know, as, a, as another challenging behavior, that might simply be because they've forgotten how to eat or they can't figure out the sequencing of how to do it any longer. Um, if someone's resisting care, you know, depending on other people for help um, really is demeaning. And it feels like an invasion of privacy and you're confused because sometimes they don't know that they need help, right? So they are trying to remain independent and they're just so confused about why are you trying to help me with something so private and so personal? And I can tell you that as a, as a, a very young woman and adolescent, I had a really serious accident. I was sleigh riding and I fractured my femur and pelvis. I hit a tree and I was in traction in the hospital for over four weeks and in a body cast from my neck to my toes for six months. And I had to have someone take care of me. I mean, I couldn't go to the bathroom. You know, I couldn't toilet myself. So I literally had to have someone help me with every form of personal care. And I did not have a diseased brain, right? I was an 11 year old girl. And, and I felt very, um, very low self-esteem and was very embarrassed and felt that it was a huge invasion of privacy because I couldn't do any of that for myself. So I cannot imagine what it feels like for someone like Grandma Millie or one of our care partners that can no longer figure out how to do that for themselves and now someone is helping them with that. You know, when I first started in this industry, I started in occupational therapy and I remember working with my first clients who I was a you know 20 something year old young girl and I was working with people that were in their 80s. And I remember sharing with them a little bit about my accident. And one of the first things I did was thank them for trusting me and allowing me to help them with something so personal. You know, and I recognized the fact that it was it was very difficult for them. So um, I just want to point that out that it's easy to say walk a mile in someone else's shoes, but even if you do, we're all unique individuals, so we're all going to experience that differently. So even though we may have had someone else who's listening in might have had a bad accident where you've had people have to help take care of you, but we all experience it differently. All right, and medication is not always the answer to managing behaviors. All right, um, there are behaviors, as a matter of fact, that are not responsive to medication. You know, um, you can't, there's not just a pill that can be given out and say, okay, you're going to stop wandering. You're gonna start walking around. You're gonna stop walking around. There's not a pill that can be given out to somebody to say, okay, let's fix that broken filter, right? And, and fix that disinhibition. Uh, there's not a pill that can be given out to somebody that is sundowning. Um, that's another challenging behavior, which 
I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. That is indicative of somebody that has um, typically Alzheimer's disease. And late in the afternoon, early in the evening, uh, these individuals experience changes in their behavior. And early research uh, felt that it was ha had to do with natural light or the lack of natural light. And new research is now leaning towards fatigue. So uh, remember that somebody that has a brain disease, just like a head injury, right? God forbid someone is in a car accident. And a lot of times medical professionals will put that individual into an induced coma. And why do they do that? They do that to allow somebody's brain to rest and heal. So with the, our care partners that we're working with, um, we want to make sure that they have time to rest their brains because their brains are working a lot harder and, and they're working overtime more so than ours. So we want to make sure that they do have, you know, some rest time um, and, you know, naps are okay too. Sleeping all day, that's a different story, but nap time and it, it is a good thing. So um, again, sundowning, it um, ha has a lot to do with, with fatigue, but those behaviors um, can be extremely detrimental. And I have seen people completely change in the um, you know, late afternoon, early evening. So what do we do then if we don't have medication, we don't wanna give somebody a medication that could potentially do more harm. So we have to look at non-pharmacological approaches, right? And behavioral techniques that can really help prevent or improve these, these behaviors. And one of the most important things to remember is behavior modification, right? And again, remembering that this behavior is a reaction to an unmet physical or emotional need. And if you go back, um, anybody who has taken any courses in any type of psychology, you know that behavior that is reinforced increases, whether that's negative behavior or positive behavior. So for instance, you know, those of you that have children that have raised your children, and you know that if they are, you know, acting out in, in school um, and they're getting attention for it, that behavior is probably going to increase because it's being reinforced. They're getting attention. So remember, behavior that's reinforced increases and behavior that's not reinforced decreases. So the more attention that we give to it, the more upset that we get the more the behavior will continue, all right? Which is why it's really important to remain calm. And we're gonna talk about some strategies too um, with managing some of these behaviors, give you an outline of a plan and give you some ideas and then allow you to ask me some questions and learn from each other at the end. So how do we um, come up with a behavioral plan? So the first thing is we have to identify the behavior, right? So what is the actual behavior? And again, is it a behavioral expression or is it a challenging behavior? And I think that in this industry and I think in life in general, we tend to be very reactive and not proactive. So I want us to think more proactively and look at what are the triggers, okay? So my trigger, I said to you, might be if you put me at the same dining table with someone who is grinding their teeth or taking their, their teeth and scraping it on the fork, right? That could be my trigger. Uh, I can tell you that with um, Grandma Millie, I, not that um, there was a specific thing that caused her agitation, but what I can tell you and what we shared with her caregivers is that when she would get angry or upset, there was a vein in her forehead. Um, she was very fair skinned and you could see this vein in her forehead. And when that vein started to protrude a little bit more, um, you knew she was getting upset about something. And so it was important for us to communicate that to her caregivers, right? So they can try to decompress, you know, and, um, minimize the situation before she were to blow. So um, knowing what the triggers are, I think is really important. Then we have to establish a realistic goal. And why did I underline realistic on the screen? Because a lot of times we just want behaviors to stop, right? Because it's, it is causing us emotional or physical harm. So we just want it to stop. But realistically speaking, for a behavior to just stop, 
um, is not very likely. Think about individuals that you know that have been smokers and they, they've tried to stop smoking, right? Very few people that I know have just stopped cold turkey, okay? That they had a realistic goal in mind. All right, I'm going to stop from, from smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I'm going to go to one pack of cigarettes a day, right? So with Grandma Millie, when she was experiencing these aggressive behaviors, which again was because of the disease, instead of me wanting that to completely go away, a realistic goal for me would, would be to have less of those episodes, right? So we have to think realistically when establishing our goals. Then we have to collect the information on when is it happening? Where is it happening? How long is it happening for? So we can, again, be more proactive about it. So we can try to eliminate those triggers so that behavior does not, uh, that, that does not come up again, right? So you wanna develop and implement a plan and a reward for changes in positive behavior. And then you're gonna continuously reevaluate this because uh, truth be told, you know, um, something might work one time for you, but may not work another. So let's talk about some keys to success, some general ideas and things that we can do. So we've talked about what some behaviors are, why some of the behaviors happen, why it's important to develop a plan, and now what can we actually do? What are some of the strategies that we can implement, right? Or that we can try. And I've already stated this to be proactive and not reactive. So that's why we want to do that plan. We want to know what those triggers are so we can eliminate the triggers and hence decrease the behavior, right? So we want to look for those signs of frustration and try to minimize that. So again, we can reduce the behaviors. Uh, we want to make sure that there's an appropriate environment that it is that person is not overly stimulated or um, lack of stimulation, right? You don't want there to be a lot of things going on at one time because their disease brains cannot process all of that. We want to set things up in advance and break down the steps. So again, they don't become so overwhelmed. Uh, we don't want to criticize. Um, that's, the, that's something that none of us want, right? We don't want to be criticized for our actions. And we want to actively listen. And listening does not just mean listening with our ears. It's also with our eyes and our other senses. So what's going on, right? Let's, let's see the, the big picture here. Um, let's look, I said this earlier, you know, communication is... Um, behavior is a form of communication, and communication is 90% nonverbal. So we really want to look and see what's happening. We want to role model appropriate behaviors. And I often say this for professional caregivers. So those of us that are getting paid to render care for someone else, because a lot of times you might see a, a caregiver who comes in with a, a really poor attitude, right? And that they are uh, moaning their negative Nellies and they're saying negative things and um, they're acting very negatively, right? So how then do you expect someone else to react to you? If uh, you came on today and you said, oh, good morning, Danielle, how are you? And I said, no, fine. And I'm not making eye contact, you know, and I am just, again, I'm, I'm feeling very down and, and very depressed. And how are you gonna feel after an hour of being together this morning? You will likely feel that as well, okay? So you wanna role model um, appropriate behaviors. So then this way, you know, and, and also know that your mood is going to affect their mood. They're gonna mirror your feelings. So even more so, by the way, because you and I can have a conversation and I can say to you, I'm just not feeling that great today, right? I'm, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling down in the dumps, um, but yet some of the people that we're working with in our families, um, they can't tell us that. So um, 
it's they're going to rely more on nonverbal communication. And so if they feel something from you, you know, then they're in turn going to model and mirror that feeling, that feeling back. Okay, so I often say this with um, Alzheimer's and related dementias, that short term memory is typically impaired first. Long term memory eventually is also impaired. But the one memory that's never going to go away is emotional memory. People remember what it feels like to feel love, to feel safe, to feel secure. Okay, so we want to make sure that we are modeling and mirroring those feelings. So remaining calm is important. I mean, you guys know this, when something very serious happens in life, and if we get nervous and we escalate our behavior, again, that's gonna be mirrored, especially from somebody that has a diseased brain and is relying on the nonverbal communication even more so. It's really important that we have eye contact, you know, and again, that use of nonverbal gestures. It's okay to ask for help. That's hard. That's really difficult as a caregiver. And I can say that from personal experience. You know, I, I still have a hard time, not even as a caregiver in life asking for help. And sometimes we need to, you know, I think especially given, you know, the situation that we're in, um, in, in dealing with this pandemic too, it's okay to ask for help. And above all in big, bold letters, you know, to take away from this today is to validate, validate, validate. And validate does not mean lying, okay? Uh, so what do I mean by validate? And I'm sure you guys, a lot of you today have heard that before, validation, the validation technique. Naomi File was actually the, well, I can't say forefather, the foremother who studied validation um, technique in working with people that have dementia. So back when I first started in healthcare, we were told to reorient people, you know, that if they were confused as to um, what their name was, where they were, what time it was, we were told to reorient them, to bring them back to person, place, and time. That can't be further from the truth in, in working with someone that has some form of dementia. Um, you want to validate, right? There's feelings, there's an unmet physical or emotional need behind the behavior. Okay, so that's what we want to tap into. We want to validate the feeling, the emotion that's behind the behavior. So let me just give you a, a quick, for instance, if someone is saying um, that they, um, you know, someone stole from them, right? And that was something very common that happened with Grandma Millie. She would often accuse, of, accuse us of stealing things, especially my one uncle, um, for some reason, um, he was the, the one that she focused on the most. I mean, she went so far to say that when she went down, walked down the street to the library and came back in an hour's time, that somebody swapped and replaced her baby grand piano in her house. And whereas we know realistically, right, that it's really difficult to move, move a piano and especially to change one out. So rationally, our rational brains are saying, that can happen. And you also want to defend yourself, right? Because we're human. And we know that we would never do that to our loved one. We want to steal from them. We want to hurt them in any way. So we want to defend ourselves. But again, you can't rationalize with an irrational brain. So what you want to do is validate the feelings behind that. So think about this for a second. If you felt that some, something was stolen from you, right? Or that there was an invasion of your privacy, how would you feel about that? So validation means validating the feeling. So instead of, uh, you know, instead of arguing and saying, nobody stole your piano, nobody switched your piano, there's not enough time, that's not possible. Um, an approach may be, you know, gosh, what kind of piano was it? Tell me what kind of piano do you, do you have, Millie? Um, how long have you had it? What does the piano look like? Uh, what kinds of, what, what's your favorite song to play on the piano? And so now I'm, I'm validating, you know, or for me to say, actually say to Millie, that has to be really scary and really frustrating, right? To, again, we're, we're looking at the feeling behind that, right? We're looking at the emotion behind that behavior. So it doesn't mean that we're lying and I'm not condoning lying. 
but I'm just looking at, okay, let's validate here. Um, just like, and my poor husband, I talk about him on um, almost every training, right? And I will come home from work some days and I'll be like, oh, I just had such a terrible day and this, this, and this happened, or, you know, um, this crisis occurred. And he will just say to me, mm, that sounds bad, Dan, but my day was worse. <laughs> that's so invalidating, you know, just for a second say, you know what? Wow, that's, that stinks, right? So um, that's, that's what I mean by, by validation, okay? So, um, and I, I can give many, many other examples too. But what I want to do is, and hopefully this is going to work, um, Tipa Snow is an occupational therapist who you guys probably have already heard of. And she is a um, world-renowned speaker and trainer in the area of dementia care and communication. And I have been so fortunate and blessed enough to have attended some of her trainings, both in person and virtually. And there is a video clip that she talks, um, that she actually role plays and talks about validation. And she teaches caregivers, again, professional and personal caregivers, one simple line to use, okay? So when someone, um, this particular clip is, she is acting out a woman who has Alzheimer's disease who keeps repeating the same story. So repetition is the challenging behavior and who keeps saying over and over again about where she grew up and what happens if you don't validate. And then what can happen if you do validate using just a very simple phrase. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing these slides. And I'm going to try to play the video for you. Okay. Janine, can you see that video? Everybody see the video up there on the screen? Yes, okay. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Hey baby, did I ever tell you I was from West Virginia? Yes, you did. That's very nice. I did? Yes. When did I tell you that? I didn't tell you that. Who's been talking about me? <laughs> Who has told you about me? See, this is what pisses me off. You and your damn big mouth. You have no business telling her. Uh-oh. Now, what happens to her? She's going to get hit. What happens to me? I get drugs. What happens to her? Nothing. Who started it? Her, because she insisted I had already told her. Here's the problem. Do I remember that I've already told her? Can I remember that I've already told her? So here's what you want to do. Instead of saying, yeah, you did or no, you didn't. Instead, what you want to say, here's the phrase. Tell me about it. Tell me about it doesn't encourage you to lie or tell the truth. What it does is open the door because that's really what I want you to do anyway. I want to talk. Will you listen is what I'm actually asking when I ask, have I ever told you I'm from West Virginia? So what you want to do is just say, tell me about it. Tell me about it is the right answer. Doesn't matter whether I've told you before or not, because what it says is you want to listen. Okay, so let me give you another chance, because I'm nice. <laughs> hey, listen, honey, have I ever told you I'm from West Virginia? Tell me about that. Yeah, hey, look here, my grandma raised me on a farm. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, hey, listen, do you know how to kill a chicken? No, I don't. Yeah, look here, look, 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 take it by the neck. Mm -hmm. Hold to it. And ring it round real hard. Honey, its head will pop off. Oh, that's <laughs> nice, it? Do it outside because they run and they'll bleed all over. So don't do it in the house. Mm -mm. Make you a good chicken, though. Yes. Yeah, hey, listen, did I ever tell you I was from West Virginia? Tell me about that. Yeah, there you go. Good. Good job. Now, when you're tired of hearing my story, because <laughs> how many times am I going to tell you my story? 40. Oh, lots, because I like to have you connected. What are you going to do? Yeah, bingo. Now, here's the deal. What we used to say is, oh, don't let them tell their stories too often. That might take them back in time. You know what? There's not a thing you can do about it. And we have actually learned that reminiscing and telling those stories is a good thing. Because what you actually do when you have them tell their stories, you fire up their brain cells. And it keeps the ones they have alive functioning because they're burning brain cells. They're actually making them work. They're firing. It's happening. Those synapses are, are making those connections. That's a good thing. 
The other reason you want to learn those stories, as the disease progresses, I will lose the ability to tell my stories. And it's really important on a bad day that you know my stories. So I think that clip of Tipa Snow, which there are many from her trainings, but I wanted to highlight that one specifically because of the phrase, tell me about it. That is, if, if you forget, oh my gosh, how, how do I validate? What am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? Um, tell me about it. You know, so when someone is extremely upset, they're angry about something, they're repetitive, tell me about it. Um, and I think, you know, that is one of the most important things to remember um, in manage, managing challenging behaviors. So I, I hope you enjoyed that clip because I, I think she's fabulous. And rather than it's, I could have acted that out for you if we were in person, but behind the, the screen here it would not have been as effective. So I, I figured the video um, might do a little bit better there. So um, just some resources that I use to put together, um, you know, this program for you today. And um, I want to leave time because I know um, Janine had said leave about 10 or 15 minutes for questions and for, um, you know, all of us to learn from each other too. And hopefully you found this useful in some way. Um, again, it's, it's tough to just have a short period of time, but hopefully there's something that you're able to take away from today. So Janine, I'll turn it back to you for questions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Danielle. This has been uh, a really great presentation and personalizes, personalizes um, the experience that we have as caregivers. I'm going to uh, unmute everyone uh, so that you are able to uh, ask some questions and uh, I've just unmuted. Hmm. All participants are unmuted. Okay, so uh, does anyone have any questions or uh, comments? And you may need to go in and unmute yourself. It's, um, it's saying that I'm unmuting everybody, but um, you're still coming up when the screen is unmuted, so or muted. So, Danielle, thank you for uh, your time this morning and doing this. I think it was very helpful. Uh, it was a great presentation. Um, it, just a follow up to that video, and it may have just been me, but when Tifa Snow was saying, um, "What are you going to do after?" you have heard my story a thousand times. Somebody in the audience said something and she said, right, but I couldn't really hear what the person in the audience said. Do you know what she keep, said? Keep listening. Keep listening, okay, thank yeah, you. Keep, keep thank listening, you. because the fact is they're gonna continue to tell those stories, like she said, and there may come a time when that person is gonna be unable to tell those stories. And uh, this, isn't, this isn't just about uh, dementia care, but there's a great book called How to Say It to Seniors. Um, I have nothing to disclose. I have no conflict or of interest. I'm not an author on the book and I don't even know the author personally. Um, but in this book, How to Say It to Seniors by David Soley, S-O-L-I-E, he talks about um, older adults, how they have this struggle to ma maintain control in their lives and also leave behind their legacy. And that's what a lot of the book is about. And in the way that I feel with repetitive stories like that is they are trying to leave behind their legacy. They want to know that their life mattered. And because they're saying that same story over and over again, and you can see in how Tipa acted this out, you know, growing up on a farm was obviously clearly important for that person. And remembering those times of, even though it may not sound very nice for some of us killing a chicken, um, but those, that was a big part of her brought up seas you know, and her, and her life. So I think it's, it's really important that we keep listening. And when you validate, you know, tell me about it, you can also t take them down another path and another road, right? So like I said to you with my, my grandma, with uh, her saying that someone switched out her piano, I, you know, that, that has to be so scary and so frustrating. So what kind of piano did you have? You know, how long have you had it for? Uh, so tell me your favorite song to play on the piano. You see what I'm doing? So 
I'm validating the emotions behind what she's feeling is happening, but at the same time, I'm, I'm gently redirecting her. So you, it's very difficult to just redirect without validating. I, I hope that helps answer the question. Yep. Thank I, you. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Um, about the missing or the stolen um, piano. What is the emotion behind that, though? I mean, why is it uh, centering around something being stolen? You said that's quite common. Why is why is that part of the brain activated to think that it's stolen? And then by talking about the emotion behind it, how does that um, I don't know quell their frustration about the item being stolen? I don't quite understand. I, I think I know what you're what you're trying to say. Yeah. So um, the part of the brain that is being impaired uh, by Alzheimer's disease. So the plaques and the tangles, the abnormal protein growths that are developing in the brain, typically start in the hippocampus and the memory cortex of the brain. Okay. And as we age, there's also damage to what they call the mirror neurons. And what mirror neurons in the brain do is they, they are able to um, disseminate expressions. Okay, so when, when we're communicating with someone, right, their expression, we can figure out what they're feeling because we can read their expression, right? But persons that um, through the aging process and because of the, the continuation of the disease, those are being destroyed. So people become untrusting because they can't read other people's uh, emotions, okay? So that is one of the reasons of why theft and infidelity seem to be the most common delusion, specifically with Alzheimer's disease. So her feeling behind that piano being stolen is of fear, is of someone um, invading her personal space, right? So she becomes um, feeling more paranoid that someone, and, and so I'm, I'm addressing the, the feeling of frustration and the paranoia and the anxiety behind that feeling. So by saying to her, that has to be off, you know, that has to be so frustrating and so scary. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Tell me more about the piano because she was a piano player. I, I told you guys, it was one of the first things I said, a big part of who she was, was playing the piano and teaching Sunday school and playing in the bell choir. Church was a big part of her life. And so that was very important to her. So she focused a lot on that. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now. I, did I did I get what you were trying to say? I think I did. Yes, right? I appreciate okay. that. Thanks. No problem. Anyone else have any questions, or does anybody have any strategies that you feel um, have worked well? If not, I can share some caregiver strategies that have been shared with me by other caregivers in the past. Um, one thing, you know, we talked about resistance to care and resistance to bathing, right? That's, that tends to be a big challenge sometimes. And uh, a caregiver that I worked with in an adult day program, um, her, her husband was one of my clients, one of my participants, and he didn't want to bathe. And she fought with him and fought with him, and he just didn't want to take off his clothes. Again, right, that feeling of... Um, I don't want someone to help me with something so personal like this, right? It's, it's, it's demeaning, it's belittling. I shouldn't have someone, you know, help me with this. So she finally said, all right, Ted, don't take off your clothes. Go in the shower with your pajamas on. And I actually found not to be brilliant because she has to wash the, the pajamas anyway. So I often say to professional caregivers, if you can't get somebody to go in the shower, they, they don't want to take their clothes off, right? Or they don't want you to touch them. I don't want someone to take my clothes off. I'll take my own damn clothes off, right? And when someone comes at you like that, even if it's somebody that we love and that we respect, I still don't want my husband to undress me and bathe me. I'll do that myself. Thank you very much, right? So then if, if I can't physically, my brain cannot tell my body how to undress. So then put me in the shower, or do, nor do I want to get naked in front of you. So put me in the shower in a gown. It, I don't have to be completely out there. You know, some people enjoy being naked. I'm not one of them. 
So I put a gown over me, cover up my breasts and, and my genitals with a, a towel or a gown, um, you know, and I, I always remember her telling me that. And I've shared that with many people that it, it does seem to work. Um, you know, just one small strategy, but anybody else have any, you know, really good strategies that have worked for you that you might want to share that could be adapted? Did you find that validation and that phrase to be helpful for you to utilize? I mean, not just with people that you're caring for, but with people in general, right? So when someone is so angry or so upset or, you know, heaven forbid, I've used that a lot. Um, as Janine mentioned earlier, I run a department on aging here in New Jersey. And, um, you know, a lot of, I, I've used the, when people have unfortunately gotten COVID or they've lost somebody to the virus, um, it's a very difficult thing to talk about, right? And so I have used that phrase, tell me about it. Danielle, I, just a, a follow up to that, um, and and the question that was asked just prior to, um, I, I'm I have an aunt, an aunt who's going through this, and I, I try to help my cousin a lot with the challenges he has with his mother, and and I, I get the validation and, and certainly the, the tell me about it when it's something like you were talking about a grant a, a piano or even anything tangible, um, but how about things that are intangible? Um, my aunt tends to always think that she hears music blasting from next door that is obviously not happening and not getting into the whole medication regimen and evaluating things like that. But how would you go about maybe redirecting that or validating that better stated to use your words? Because he will do that. And I have as well on occasion. And she's just vehement that this is going on and she hears it. And why can't we hear it? Um. Yeah, I, I sometimes wouldn't even say that you can't hear it. I would ask more questions about the music. What kind of music are they playing? Could, do, you, do you recognize any of the songs? Um, can you tell me some of the words that, that are um, being sung in the song itself? Because again, there's a, there's a reason why she's experiencing this um, auditory hallucination, right? So um, maybe it's, it's something traumatic. I, I, I don't really know because I don't know her well, but I would like to know a little bit more specifically about the hallucination. So I would wanna know some details about it because that might help me understand why she keeps hearing this. Is it the same music over and over again? Um, is it loud music? You know, it could be something triggered from her past. Um, I, I, I'm kind of like smiling because I live across the street from a schoolyard and at night it, it's supposed to close, you know, when the sun goes down and the teenagers go over there almost every night and blast their music. And it's always 11 o'clock at night when I'm trying to go to bed and it echoes over, you know, into my house. And I can see myself, you know, having some type of brain disease, heaven forbid, and then I'm going to hear this loud music. <laughs> because I've been hearing it for years, living across the street from the schoolyard. So I might just ask questions, but when we say that we can't hear it, um, that might cause more alarm and more stress for her. You don't have to lie and say that you do hear it, but then just start to ask questions about the music specifically. Thank right, and then, and then ask her, say, is there any way do you think what can we do to quiet it down? You know, it, do you think maybe we can play some different kind of music? You know, what's your favorite music? Maybe, maybe we can play some music and we can sing and we can get rid of their music. Well, she's, she's actually gone next door and asked them to turn it down. Um, and yeah. my, my cousin has uh, had to escort her away from their front door. Uh, but that's a whole nother challenge. Yeah. Uh, but but not but I hear what you're saying, and it does make sense. So thank you. It does, and like I said before, it's not you know the behaviors aren't just going to go away, and that's the tough part for us. So a realistic goal, right, might be for her not to go next door anymore. <laughs> that might be the real. That might be step one of the goal. Right. Danielle, I have a question. It's Janine. Sure. Um, <laughs> What what do you recommend for caregivers when the um, the person with the dementia starts calling you names, uh, not nice names? 
and how do you recommend um, redirecting or, re or guiding them uh, away from that? Or do you uh, guide them away well, from that? Well, that's really hard, like I said, because we're human. And it's really hard to take that, especially because I said this before, I thanked all of you for being caregivers because it is the, the, the most thankless job that, that there is around and the most difficult job. No pay, no vacation time, you know, I get it. So when someone is calling you names, it's really hard not to personalize it, especially when it is, you know, it feels like it's a personal attack. Um, and by being able to keep telling yourself in your head over and over again, that's the disease, that's the disease, that's the disease. But sometimes you literally need to walk away from it um, because the person is saying that and it's not always personal, right? It's coming from a place of stress and agitation within themselves because they know that you're doing so much for them. And at the same time, they're embarrassed and they're upset over it. So by them saying those things to you, it, it, it takes a toll. And, but to get them to stop, that's really tough. Um, I, I, can't, I wish that I could just say to you, okay, this, this, is, this is the way to do it. And every single person is different. But like when Millie were to say really nasty things to me, um, I, would, I, I would actually ask her, you know, what makes you feel that way? You know, um, is there something that I can do better? Um, and sometimes literally I had to tap out, you know, I had to hit the pause button. And uh, like I said, sometimes we do need to just take a breath, walk away, use the memory impairment to our advantage and try to come back with a different approach and redirect um but try it's really hard i know i know i've been there done that but try not to personalize yeah i agree i think too uh, some of the feelings that the person with dementia has is that they are especially in the mild to moderate stages they are really frustrated that they're losing their independence mm -hmm. um i can see it in myself too, or if I look down the road, um, you know, I don't want people to um, come into my home and tell me what I'm supposed to do next, or it's time to get dressed, and uh, I don't want those things, And but that's um, part of the reality of what I may or may not need in the future, but these folks are experiencing, and putting myself in their shoes, um, you know, can I, it can, it certainly helps me to detach uh, from the, the name calling and the meanness that can come out. Yeah. I mean, um, Janine, I, I gave you that little write up and um, a resource. The Alzheimer's Association has a brochure, actually it's a fairly new one, they updated it recently, about how to manage challenging behaviors and it actually breaks up, you know, each challenging behavior with specific strategies. I just talked generalizations because we didn't really have a lot of time to go into each behavior, here are strategies, each behavior, here are strategies. But um, what Janine has for you that she'll send out, you, it actually has the link to the Alzheimer's Association behaviors um, brochure and handout, which I think will be helpful, as well as the National Institute on Aging and some specific strategies that they have. And remember, you know, it may work for one, not for another, and it may work one minute, and then the next hour, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And that's the tough part, is because we have to keep trying. Yes. So I think, you know, with the name calling too, sometimes, you know, what's the trigger going back to that behavioral plan, right? Um, what, what's the trigger? Is it something that you say or do that's, that you find that person is, is calling you this? Um, you know, the, see if there is a plan, if there is, um, I don't know, if, if there is something there, right? Mm -hmm. So, I know that I had one resident who felt, this was many years ago, I, I really resembled his wife when they were younger. 
And so he would say things to me um, <laughs> and because he just thought that I was his wife, mm -hmm. you know? So then we realized, okay, then certain situations, you know, when it was um, time for him to go to the bathroom, when it was time for him to get changed or showered, I had to remove myself from that situation and we had to change caregivers because I was the trigger. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know. I mean, it could be something that you're saying or doing. I know there's certain things that an annoy the living heck out of you know, my husband when I do it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if heaven forbid he became, had an injured brain, um, I probably shouldn't do those certain things because I know that's going to trigger him. And if his filter's broken, he's going to say something to me. Like right now, he knows not to say it. <laughs> he knows better. But if heaven forbid he becomes ill, um, he will likely say that. So now I have to modify my own behavior. Right. So this has been wonderful um, and very significant information that you've shared with us today. Um, it has come to the hour um, of our webinar. And um, I do want to just ask if anyone else has a pressing question that you'd like to ask Danielle before we close. Okay, I thank everyone for participating today. Oh, I see a hand up for Carol May. Go ahead, Carol. Okay, am I unmuted? Let me see. You are unmuted. You are. Okay, very good. Um, I have a question. Um, does you have any uh, suggestions for any strategies? Um, <clears throat> to forgive ourselves when we mess up. <laughs> mm. You know, it's just, it's learning to be good to yourself. And I, I, I feel you, Carolyn, and, and I, I can empathize. And just like I said, and that's why I shared that story with you of when I messed up. And that wasn't the only time I messed up many times. And to, just know that it's okay and to say those mantras to yourself that it's okay if i mess up because i'm doing the best i can right i'm i i am a good person and i am doing the best i can and i've also found that a lot of my colleagues um, especially you know some licensed counselors and clinicians that i've worked with in the past have really said that um meditation you know, and mindfulness it has been very helpful for them. And I think that we can certainly talk to Janine and, and maybe do another program or, or she can find someone other than me too, to do something about how to manage, how to manage that, that caregiver stress and, and that, that burden, because it's heavy. And I, I wish I had an easy answer for you, except to just keep telling yourself that I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing, I'm doing the best I can because you are. And, and we often as caregivers don't give ourselves credit. We're always pointing out what we could be doing better. And, oh, why did I do this? I should have done this, right? Uh, I, I, again, one of my colleagues said that we, we need to take the word should out of the dictionary. Mm. Thank you. Be good to yourself. And, and thank you, thank you for the job that you do. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Carol, for sharing that too. And uh, Danielle, for your support. And uh, we all need to support one another. And that's a great idea of, of having another um, opportunity to have a webinar um, in the next few months on um, you know, managing or, or assisting with the, that it, it compiles. And I think that's the, the where meditation and mindfulness can come in to help all of us in our jobs. Well, Danielle, thank you so much uh, for today. And uh, we will be forwarding the recording of this to everyone who's attended and the registrants uh, who haven't been able to attend today as we did with uh, Maggie's uh, presentation and 
uh, with that, again, thank you so much. And I hope everyone does have a good weekend and feel free to give us a call um, at Chandler Hall if you have any questions or, and I will also be sending the information that Danielle has forwarded to me to everyone as well. So thank you, Danielle. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.